Hey, I'm Nathaniel Fawson. I'm a professional archaeologist, and this channel is devoted to the archaeology of North America, especially in the regions we call the Eastern Woodlands. Now, today I wanted to take a look at the cultures that archaeologists gloss as hunter-gatherers, because this group of cultures includes most of the peoples that I talk about on this channel. Not all of them, but most of them. Now, hunter-gatherers have a lot of very odd and old-fashioned ideas attached to them, both in kind of the, the general public imagination and also still in the minds of a lot of archaeologists. And a lot of these kind of weird ideas that I'm going to explain are really just the baggage that we inherited from earlier generations of archaeologists. Now, first off, hunter-gatherer is a term that we use to describe cultures that don't base their economies on agriculture or animal husbandry. There might be some gardening here and there, but that's supplemental. It's not the basis of the entire economy. And this subject is extremely important to archaeology as a whole because prior to the development of agriculture, sometime probably before about 10,000 years ago, you know, various places and times around the world though, all humans on the planet were one style of hunter-gatherer or another. So it's important to understand what hunter-gatherers are and what they're like. Early on in archaeology, say like the 19th and early 20th centuries, hunter-gatherers were thought of in very negative terms. The, the term hunter-gatherer wasn't really the norm at the time, yet archaeologists and anthropologists also usually just called them all savages. And this obviously played right into the egos of the mostly European archaeologists who came from very agrarian and urbanized group of nations that were in the habit of running into hunter-gatherer groups around the world and taking over their land and taking their stuff. There was a lot of talk about, you know, civilizing the savages. Can we civilize the savages? Should we? Or civilizing the barbarians if those people had happened to develop agriculture but didn't have all the other social norms and things that the anthropologists thought made them as, you know, civilized people superior. And the whole thing was very tied up in the idea that people are somehow supposed to be sedentary agriculturalists and anything else is kind of a degenerate or regressive or backward way of being, you know, a person or a society or a culture. And frankly, the entire discipline was just a mess. And I could go on about that, but I'd rather move on to how our ideas started to change. So in the late 1960s, archaeologists started thinking very different about hunter-gatherers. A guy named uh, Marshall Solins described them as the original affluent society, and that label really stuck in the literature for over a decade. His basic premise was that hunter-gatherers, that they're small groups of very mobile foragers, and that makes having a lot of uh, extra material possessions really impractical. And so since these people can't get preoccupied with accumulating a bunch of material wealth, the result is that it's very easy for them to meet all of their material needs. So the small numbers also make it very difficult for anyone to consolidate a significant amount of political power and start subjugating other groups, like creating peasant classes or slave classes or whatever. Um, people like there, there's intergroup and inter-individual uh, competition and and you know, like power relations and stuff like that. But they're not these like deeply rooted institutional separations of you know the um, like political leaders and and all their underlings because there just aren't enough people living in one place like um, interacting with each other. At least that was what he was thinking at that time. Um, these groups were also allegedly non-territorial, and all of this was coming out of the 1960s when a lot of hippies were idealizing minimalism and starting communes and stuff like that. So it's really not an accident that a bunch of archaeologists started to think kind of in these different ways about what hunter-gatherers were and are like at this time. There are still some really, really serious problems with this kind of idea about what hunter-gatherers are, you know, the, it, there's, a, there's a lot of problems with it. So first, it really obscures the huge amount of variation that we see in real-world hunter-gatherers. Like I said, if you weren't part of a farming economy or herding economy, you were a hunter-gatherer. And since this early model of what that meant was so essentialized, it made everything that happened prior to the invention of agriculture and, and farming seem like a timeless, unchanging mass of ahistorical stuff. 
So the hunter-gatherers were kind of cast as the original, and all of the cultural differences that we see now are developed out of that original, while modern hunter-gatherers just stuck with the original and supposedly hadn't changed or deviated much. And there's a... We've done enough work now that we know that that's simply not the case. In the 1980s, we started to really deal with the amount of diversity that was possible within this class of cultures. Uh, people like Lewis Benford, he was looking at how some groups used like a more foraging strategy, more similar to the kind of original affluent society idea where uh, they move very frequently from base camp to base camp and source what they need from the vicinity, like the immediate environment as they go, where on the other end of the spectrum, collectors are moving base camps less frequently, so they're a little more sedentary, but they have these like special purpose logistical sites like fishing camps or hickory groves that are near the base camps, but they go there to target very specific resources in, in bulk and then come back to the home base after a few days. This isn't like a, a one or the other sort of situation. It's more of a continuum, like I said, and the strategy might change based on the season. And at the same time that Benford was writing uh, about foragers and collectors, uh, a guy named James Woodburn was looking at things from more of like a production standpoint than Benford's more landscape-oriented models. And Woodburn was focused on if a culture was organized around immediate return on uh, their work or delayed returns on their work. So immediate return works well in places like very tropical environments with very little seasonal variation in uh, what food is available when. And delayed return involves the, the processing and long-term storage of resources, which might be more closely associated with more polar regions, although it still works in tropical regions, of course. Salmon runs, for instance, make a, a huge amount of food readily available for a very short period of time, but you can smoke it and store it to provide kind of a, a baseline subsistence base during the, the winter months when those salmon aren't available. And the, the thing with food storage is that you have to be able to depend on having access to the food that you've stored up, to the products of all that work. Not just because it was your work, but because if you don't have it, you starve. So classically speaking, these groups are thought to be less mobile and much more territorial. They, they defend their property, essentially. Another archaeologist from Durham in, uh, in England took that kind of basic framework that Benford and Woodburn were, were putting out, and he broke those hunter-gatherers up into four subgroups. So the first group is the group that doesn't really use specialized logistical sites. Um, they stay very mobile. They don't have much of an institutional political hierarchy, and they don't really have much of a reason to be territorial because they're just kind of collecting things from the immediate, immediate vicinity and then moving on to the next site. Um, so as long as they're like, uh, rotations aren't lining up with anyone else's rotations, everything's fine. So this is like the, the classical uh, original affluent society that Solens was describing. The, the second group is mobile groups that do use logistical sites, but don't do much in the way of defending of, of territory. The third group are the mobile groups that use logistical sites and, and do defend those uh, that territory or those sites um, from outsiders who might come and steal their you know their food stores basically and then the fourth group are sedentary groups so no longer mobile groups that um, have to defend a defined kind of territory um, and depend on stored resources but don't practice agriculture and this group, uh, this fourth group, usually has some level of institutional social hierarchy involved in organizing all the labor that's going into, you know, producing all this, well, collecting up all this food and processing it and, and storing it. Now, unfortunately, because it's in a set of four, it's very easy for that theoretical system to drag us right back to the whole unidirectional cultural evolution idea that makes it look like, you know, cultures are somehow supposed to move through these stages on the way to stage four and then ultimately towards their agricultural destinies. In the early 2000s, Rolly Conway took that cultural evolutionary idea and kind of took that on directly. 
by outlining six pervasive assumptions, or you, you might think of them as myths about hunter-gatherers that are they're just demonstrably wrong. And they've been holding us back in our research for, for decades. So at the risk of this turning into a BuzzFeed article, I'm going to go through those six because his observations are pretty important and pretty easy to grasp why, um, why that kind of unidirectional unidirection model is wrong. So first, there's this assumption that cultures progress from simple to complex, with the first of those four types being the most simple and the fourth being the most complex. And you know, when archaeologists are talking about social complexity, we're really talking about um, how people are organized in their in their time. So, uh, are some people designated administrators? Are some people designated laborers? Are some people, de you know, um, designated supervisors? Things like that. You you get that in um, agricultural societies and things like that. But um, there's the, that kind of idea that, you know, we start simple and we go towards complexity and kind of this trudge um, is one that doesn't really play out in the archaeological record. Um, the, this idea that, like, simple cultures eventually um, hit their carrying capacity in their environment, so they have to start being more deliberate and intensive in their subsistence strategies to feed larger populations, and they have to store food to manage that risk and that forces them to be more sedentary and defend their surplus. But on the other hand, we have indications that some of these strategies work really, really well in particular environments and don't work well at all in others. So that forms kind of a paradox. Was it an environmental thing or was it a progress thing? And if we actually look at how these systems work, straight immediate return foraging does not work well in places like the polar north. A lot of resources are very strictly available in particular seasons, and in other seasons there are just very few resources to take their place. So for that reason, it's entirely possible that the cultures that emerged in places like Siberia, Alaska, Scandinavia, all belonged to Roly Conway's um, group two or group three, or maybe, well, more likely group two or group three, three as soon as they started to develop in those environments because the, the original affluent society, that type one, doesn't work in those environments. So second, it's assumed that all early Homo sapiens were exclusively simple, group one of the four. But there's some evidence that this wasn't really the case. Um, in France, there's a Neanderthal site called uh, Dordon Grotte, uh, number 16, where our evolutionary cousins, Neanderthals, were also uh, smoking fish and eels and so on in mass and you know it like far more than they could use all at once so that's unequivocally a group two or three or even four behavior um, if Neanderthals are already thinking logistically then there's really no reason to think that early homo sapiens weren't also using these kinds of more complex logistical strategies from the, you know, from the very beginning of our species' existence. Now, the, the third misconception is that um, transition towards group four is gradual. And again, there's really no reason to believe that's true because major climatic shifts can render one strategy completely useless and others really well suited. And that goes for major demographic changes as well, like migrations or population booms. Now, fourth, change is permanent. Um, and this assumption is pretty obviously wrong for all the same reasons that the third one's wrong. It's not just possible but likely that environmental or demographic changes can and will produce changes in subsistence strategies. So the, the first Americans came onto the continent from the north, where more strict logistical strategies are necessary for survival. And as those people became working their way into the eastern woodlands, those kinds of seasonally determined intensification strategies are still possible, but they're much less necessary. And in those late Paleo-Indian and early Archaic contexts, we don't see much evidence for a lot of food storage or uh, intensive processing in the southeast. Those kinds of practices would emerge very, um, very suddenly and aggressively in the Middle Archaic period, several thousand years later. A fifth 
is the, the misconception that moving towards complexity is equivalent to moving closer to agriculture. And this is another assumption that doesn't really play out well in the archaeological record because agriculture was only invented a handful of times worldwide, while the economic groups three and four have emerged and subsided and, and re-emerged multiple times. So, and hunter-gatherers know everything they need to know about how to be farmers. Like, they know how seeds work. The, they choose not to farm because they've got other methods of meeting their thermodynamic needs, their food needs, their, their housing needs, their shelter needs, and so on. In, in Florida also, the, there's a group called the, the Calusa that were fully stratified, territorial, complex society with, you know, big man political uh, leaders, foreign trade, and all the rest of it, but they didn't farm. So you can have, you know, th these, these full-blown hierarchical societies that don't involve agric agriculture in their economy whatsoever. And the, the same kind of thing uh, goes for the Jomon uh, hunter-gatherers in Japan. Before rice agriculture was introduced to those islands, uh, they had been, you know, group three and sometimes group four hunter-gatherers for several thousand years and showed no signs of ever getting anywhere near developing uh, agriculture as an economic base. They were, you know, hunters, fishers, and relied heavily on mass resources, uh, nuts from trees as their, um, their economic and, and sustenance base. So sixth and finally, the, the hunter-gatherer uh, groups that become farmers at some point are perceived to be more significant and interesting than the ones that don't. And this is caught up in that whole progressivist mentality that I don't really find to be well-founded. Um, and most archaeologists don't either. Agriculture does provide some advantages, but they all come at pretty steep costs. Agricultural societies artificially increase their populations by int intensifying their production, and once that population gets to a certain density, it becomes impossible to stop farming, because if you do, people starve. So these inflated uh, populations are, are locked in to a um, an agricultural economic subsistence base. Hunter-gatherers go through their own processes of change that are, you know, just as interesting and nuanced as any other subsistence strategy. And they, they build and they do things like build and maintain elaborate trade networks across, you know, entire continents like we see at places like Poverty Point. Um, they, you know, will have uh, complex religious practices also seen at Poverty Point. Um, and the, the last decade or so, there's been a, a really big turn towards understanding how hunter-gatherers um, change over time in their own kind of local and temporal contexts with, you know, pasts and futures that they're aware of and engaged with and thinking about um, with, you know, instead of characterizing them as, as primitive people slowly marching towards their allegedly inevitable destiny to be farmers. So I hope you found that interesting. If you have any questions, you can leave those down in the comments section. And as always, thank you for watching.